Well, good evening, everyone, and I want to welcome you to our Tuesday evening Bible study. Uh, we have been taking a look for the last seven weeks, this is week eight, at the life of John the Baptist, and we have been pulling principles from his story to apply to our lives, and I can only pray and hope that this has been a blessing to you. I've certainly enjoyed uh, digging in and looking at the life of John and uh, how he prepared the way for the first arrival of Jesus, uh, who then stepped on the scene and became uh, the center of, of attention, the center of the story. And uh, John's great um, uh, opus, as he said, uh, referring to Jesus, he must increase and I must decrease. And we have been witnessing that uh, and we're looking at his life and tonight we're bringing a conclusion to that and uh, I can't believe that we've come so far and I hope again that you've enjoyed this in just a moment we're going to see or worship along with our church worship team from this past Sunday with a great song called we will embrace your move and I hope that you'll worship along with us as we play that uh, in the meantime, you can go ahead and get your Bible open to John's Gospel, Chapter 5. Your Bible or your device, whatever you happen to have with you. John's Gospel, Chapter 5. And uh, let's just open our time together in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great opportunity that we have to be together online tonight. Lord, as we dig into your word, I pray that by the power of your spirit, you would heighten our understanding and help us to dig as much out of this as we can. May we be drawn closer to you and have a greater understanding of Jesus Christ. May we be more like him every day. I pray God for all those who are watching this evening and who will be watching later, that you would anoint their ears to listen and their hearts to understand and bless them Lord and keep them in good health. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, worship along with us as we, as our worship team sings this beautiful song, We Will Embrace Your Move. And then in a few minutes, we'll dive in together. We will. 
Amen. Believe that. Our God is preparing a feast. Our God is preparing a feast. The Spirit rides a cup, calling out to the least. And filling our lampstands with oil. And He is restoring His people. fantastic song of worship and I hope that you were worshiping the Lord along with that a faster song it's a good song to get up and dance to <laughs> and uh, yes Lord just pour out more of yourself and we will embrace your move uh, and I want to be right in the center of God's will and I hope that that is your desire as well well I hope you have your Bible or your device open to John's gospel chapter 5 and we're going to bring a conclusion tonight to our study of John the Baptist. And we're calling this study tonight, John as Jesus saw him. John as Jesus saw him. Now, John's words, even though they are a couple of thousand years old now, uh, they still resound for us today. But also... Uh, even more so, echo echoing through time, are the words spoken by Jesus Christ about John. And these words, they paint a remarkable portrait of John as Jesus saw him. And above all else, uh, they confirm uh, the outstanding character of John the Baptist. They're kind of like a divine character reference, if you will, and uh, Jesus' words reflect his opinion of John. And it's an opinion that is without rival, without equal. Because as the Son of God, uh, he has unparalleled insight into every person's soul. His judgments, they are matchless. Uh, and before we read his endorsement of John, I want us to take a moment to examine Jesus' credentials and discover uh, what sets his opinion and his judgments apart from others. Now, the integrity of Jesus' opinion rests soundly on four uh, firm foundations. And here's the first one. Jesus' opinions and judgments are authoritative and inspired. Jesus' words, Jesus' opinions and judgments are authoritative and inspired. Jesus' credentials becomes clear to us in John chapter 5, uh, where an interesting story is unfolding. Uh, Jesus has healed a man on the Sabbath, which uh, 
which whips up the anger and the angst of the Sabbath conscious Pharisees. Uh, and they angrily <laughs> accuse him of law breaking. And later they accuse him of blasphemy when he justifies his actions by linking them with God the Father. But rather than shying away, Jesus uh, determinedly elaborates on his claim to equality with God. And we're going to see that in John chapter 5, verses 19 through 23. So Jesus explained, I tell you the truth. The Son can do nothing by himself, who does only what he sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he is doing. In fact, the Father will show him how to do even greater works than healing this man. Then you will be truly astonished. For just as the Father gives life to those he raises from the dead, so the Son gives life to anyone he wants. In addition, the Father judges no one. Instead, he has given the Son absolute authority to judge so that everyone will honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Anyone who does not honor the Son is certainly uh, not honoring the Father who sent him. Now, unlike our judgments, which are backed up only by our own authority and are limited to our own finite short-sighted perspective, we find that Christ's judgments are uh, authoritative um, and inspired. Check out this uh, next verse, John chapter 5, verses 26 and 27. The Father has life in himself, and he has granted that, that same life-giving power to his Son, and he has given him authority to judge everyone, because he is the Son of of man amen uh, Jesus judgments they are authoritative and they are inspired because he is equal with the father they are authoritative because it is a father who has given him the right and the authority to judge and they are inspired because Jesus shares the same divine nature as the father amen now a second thing tonight Jesus' opinions and judgments are just and objective. Jesus' opinions and judgments are just and objective. So a little bit further down in John chapter 5, uh, we discover the second foundation for the integrity of Jesus' words. John chapter 5 and verse 30 says, I can do nothing on my own. I judge as God tells me. Therefore, my judgment is just because I carry out the will of the one who sent me, not my own will. Now, because Jesus seeks the Father's will um, instead of his own, his judgment is objective. It does not suffer from uh, the selfishness and favoritism that often clouds our opinions. And because of this safeguard, the safeguard of objectivity, uh, Jesus' judgments are just. They are uh, reliable and they are right. And that leads to the uh, third foundation for the integrity of Jesus' words. Jesus' opinions and judgments are righteous and true. There's a verse in the book of Revelation that says the alphas, the alpha and omega's words are trustworthy and true. Jesus' words are righteous and true. And this is revealed um, in another debate with the Jewish leaders where uh, Jesus says this in John chapter 7, verses 23 and 24. For if the correct time for circumcising your son falls on the Sabbath, you go ahead and do it so as not to break the law of Moses. So why should you be angry with me 
for healing a man on the Sabbath. Look beneath the surface so that you can judge correctly. The implication is that Jesus judges rightly, unlike the religious leaders who judged according to the way things look. Jesus is able to go beyond the way things look and see the real heart of something and make a, a righteous, uh, a right judgment. And this is a fact that he uh, underscores in um, John chapter 8, verses 12 through 16. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. The Pharisees replied, you are making those claims about yourself. Such testimony is not valid. Jesus told them, these claims are valid even though I make them about myself. For I know where I came from and where I am going, but you don't know this about me. You judge me by human standards, but I do not judge anyone. And if I did, my judgment would be correct in every respect because I am not alone. The Father who sent me is with me. So Jesus is in a unique position, being equal with God, being able to see beyond the surface into the heart of a thing uh, makes his judgments uh, unique and right. I mean, he said to these religious leaders, you judge uh, according to the flesh. And that's an, quite an indictment. And in contrast, Jesus sees what is inside a person, which makes his judgments righteous and true. Remember what God told the prophet Samuel, 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7, the Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart. Amen. So when Jesus judges an individual, it is never according to appearance. It is always according to the condition of the heart. He sees motive. We see action. He sees reasons. We see results. We are impressed with looks. He is impressed with character. Likewise, when Jesus saw John, he observed something altogether different than what anyone else saw. He saw John's heart. And that leads me to the fourth uh, foundation about the integrity of Jesus' words tonight. Jesus' opinions and judgments are deep and profound. Jesus opinion, his judgments, they come from deep and profound knowledge of past, present, and future events. You know, when his friend Lazarus was, was gravely ill, uh, Lazarus' sisters sent messengers to Jesus to ask for his help. But I want you to notice uh, Jesus' response in John chapter 11, verse 4. Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. Now, can any of us say that uh, a sickness will not lead to death? Can any of us confidently tell a person with terminal illness, you will not die? Jesus, however, could see the end result of Lazarus' illness and the purpose behind it. It was to bring glory to God and glory to himself. Jesus' knowledge offers uh, immeasurable comfort to the suffering believer. Jesus knows our sorrow. He can see the entire suffering. Even, uh, even death does not escape his view. And remembering that we are safely in his sight, it reassures us that he cares and that an underlying purpose exists in our pain and God will ultimately be glorified. 
So we can trust Jesus' words, all right, based on those uh, far, those uh, four uh, foundations that we looked at, those four pillars. Uh, his integrity is impeccable. Now, now that we know that, uh, let's consider his appraisal of John the Baptist. Now, Jesus' thoughts about John can be paraphrased into four uh, nutshell statements. And as we examine each one, we'll find that Christ uh, elevates John as a spiritual uh, model to follow. First of all, John's testimony of Jesus was true. John's testimony of Jesus was true. And this, this is taken from uh, John chapter 5, verses 31 to 33. If I were to testify on my own behalf, my testimony would not be valid. But someone else is also testifying about me. And I assure you that everything he says about me is true. In fact, you send investigators to listen to John the Baptist and his testimony about me was true. You see, John trafficked in the realm of truth. And this character quality uh, guarded John's reputation. As Jesus pointed out, uh, John's truthfulness made him a reliable witness. Now we too are called to live in this liberating realm of the truth. Uh, it is the it's only there that we can experience peace of mind. Now people uh, with lies littering their past, uh, they have to have good memories uh, to keep their story straight. But people with a truth-filled past are free from from that anxiety because they're able to enjoy a clean conscience. Amen. Now, the second thing that Jesus said about John was that John was a burning and shining lamp. A burning and shining lamp. Now, that's a bit of a mysterious statement to make about a person, but it's a metaphor, okay? A very astute metaphor taken from John chapter 5 and verse 35. It says, Jesus said, John was like a burning and shining lamp. And you were excited for a while about his message. As a lamp, John was not the light, but he contained the light. He was merely a vessel out of which the light shone. And as a lamp, he had two purposes. The first was to dispel darkness and the second to guide others. And in the same way, God calls us to be containers of light lamps that shine the truth of christ to a dark and misguided world and i'll tell you folks in the middle of this pandemic we as believers need to shine the light of jesus to this world amen now a third thing that jesus said about john and i like this one john was more than a prophet john was more than a prophet This is another facet of John's character that Jesus is pointing out here. And as is so often the case with Jesus, he, he, he starts with simple questions and then builds to a dramatic climax to express this point. Now this is coming from Matthew chapter 11, verses seven through nine. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began talking about him to the crowds what kind of man did you go into the wilderness to see was he a weak reed swayed by every breath of wind or were you expecting to see a man dressed in expensive clothes no people with expensive clothes live in palaces were you looking for a prophet yes he is more than a prophet John was a was a gritty prophet and there was no vacillating he was not a flimsy reed that bent and blowed in the wind neither was he a pampered uh, he was a man 
who lived in the wilderness. And like the wilderness, his lifestyle was stark and uncompromising. He was a man among men, and he was a prophet among prophets. And in the same way, uh, we may be required to be more than the average believer. Only God knows what treacherous times lay ahead for us. The kingdom of God has always suffered violent attacks from the enemy. But sadly, God often finds his soldiers soft and complacent. J.K. Chesterton once said this, The Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. And what tough times require is an intensity of devotion equal to, equal to the intensity of the persecution. God seeks people with drive and purpose. And if you'll allow me, prophet like uh, zeal and fervor to fight the difficult battles that lay ahead for the church is Jesus going to find you strong on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ or is he going to find you like a weak reed blowing and bending under the wind John is a good model to follow then there's uh one really interesting thing that Jesus said about John and is this. John was the greatest who ever lived apart from Jesus. Um, this statement, by the way, is taken from uh, Matthew chapter 11 and verse 11. I tell you the truth, of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. Possibly Jesus was uh, reminiscing about all John's admirable qualities when he made this pronouncement about him. And John's greatness, though, was the sum of his humility, his simple devotion, integrity, vision, courage, self-discipline, diligence, and purity. Now, regarding you and me today, this uh, study concludes the same way it began eight weeks ago when we talked uh, uh, about the Nobel Prize. Well, the Nobel Prize Jesus gave John the Baptist is in recognition of his greatness. And can we ever hope to achieve even one facet of such greatness? The key, according to J. Oswald Sanders, is based on the depth of our convictions. Listen to this quote uh, from a book called Robust in Faith by J. Oswald Sanders. A small man may entertain strong opinions. A great man cherishes strong convictions. Opinions cost only breath. Convictions may well cost blood. John's convictions were of such an order as to command the attention of the whole nation to draw a vast crowd, he simply went into the desert and preached repentance, and his convictions deeply affected those who flocked to him. So in my opinion, it really comes down to this. Do I believe what I say I believe? Do I believe what I say I believe? Now for a moment, I want you to place yourself beneath the capable and discerning eye of our Savior Jesus Christ and consider what kind of character reference he would give to you. And I want you to use these following questions as your criteria. First, do I speak only the truth? The words that come from my lips, are they only the truth? Is my lamp burning and shining? When people look at me, are they able to see Jesus in me? 
Do the qualities of my character make me rise above the ordinary and the mediocre? What would Jesus say about your character? Am I tough-minded enough to hang in there even when people don't change? In many ways, the baptizer, John the Baptist, was one of a kind. He was unique. And we can't follow him in every way. Um, but God's call to us is unique, and we can learn from John's life. Down through the passage of time, uh, these principles from John's life, they... They light up our skies and they beckon us to follow. Against the darkness of our world, John's humility, devotion, conviction, simplicity, zeal, courage, they flash as a guiding light, a light of moral integrity. And Jesus was right. Uh, John uh, 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 was... Uh, the greatest of his time next to Jesus Christ and uh, when God looks down at me I want him to find me faithful amen and I hope that this has been a challenge and a blessing for you tonight in fact these past eight weeks uh, have been very rich for me personally and I've enjoyed spending this time with you and I hope that you've enjoyed it as well. Now, next Tuesday, we're going to begin a series. We're going to actually start uh, going through the book of Titus. The book of Titus. And we're going to go through it verse by verse. And that's going to take us into the June area. Uh, somewhere maybe first or second week of June. And then uh, we're going to take a little break for the summer from uh, our online Bible studies. So I hope that you'll join us uh, every Tuesday evening at 6.30 with your Bible handy and a notebook. And we're going to go through, work our way through an entire book of the Bible, the book of Titus. And it's going to be a good and a rich time. And I believe that you will find it to be a blessing to you. Now I want us to close in a time of prayer. And I want to comfort you with these words is that Jesus knows all about the things that you are going through whether it's big or small. Uh, nothing escapes his watchful eye. He sees the pain that you're in. He sees the problem you're facing, no matter what it may be. And so in a moment, we're just gonna pray. And as we do, I want you to just maybe, as I pray, speak those needs out loud to God. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing hearing by the word of God now tonight we heard the word of God and hopefully our faith has been built up and you can confidently place these needs before the throne of God tonight as we pray let's bow our heads Heavenly Father we thank you for this time that we got to spend together in the word of God your word is quick and powerful and sharper than a double-edged sword and it can cut even deeper than the surgeon's scalpel to perform surgery on our souls. And when we look into your word, we, we see ourselves as you see us. Everything is laid bare. But God, I'm thankful for models in your word like John the Baptist, who lived a life of integrity, preparing people for the coming of Christ. In, in a similar way, that's what you call us to do, to prepare this world for your second coming. May we do so faithfully. Lord, I stand with my brothers and sisters tonight who are watching and who are praying with me. Lord, you know every need. Father, I placed every situation in your capable hands, whether it's a financial need, an emotional need, and a relational, a spiritual, a physical. Lord, you know the end from the beginning. 
But Father, I pray that you would meet each need and undertake for each and every situation. And I pray, Lord, that you would infuse all of us with a little dose of hope. You know all about our struggles and you will bless till the day is done. I thank you for that. Bless my brothers and sisters tonight. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Well, the Lord bless you. I want to thank you for tuning in again this evening. And we'll see you again next Tuesday night at 6.30 as we start working our way through the book of Titus. The Lord bless you.